Hello, Dream Team, and a very warm welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Rugby, Season 3, Episode 4. It's good to have you with us. There is a lot to get through this week. Wasps, Red Roses, Rugby League on this week's show with Rugby's Eric and Ernie. How are you both? <laughs> Eric and Ernie? We're um, like Bill and Ben the Flowerpot Men, you're weed, just sitting in the middle, so relax. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good, thank good. you. You go, you're off to Australia? I'm actually not, but no, neither I am think, I. Let's you move not, on. Do we know anyone who's going? No, we don't. Okay, no, yeah. Let's move swiftly on. We have got an interview today, and we'll get straight into it, that I think we may have craved above all others. This is going to be fascinating. Before we introduce him, a quick whip through his CV, which, if I'm being honest with you, could actually be a show in itself. In the 13 man code in his playing days, he amassed no less than 37 winner's medals, 25 with Wigan alone. 36 caps for Great Britain, Hall of Fame, Man of Steel. He once scored 10 tries in a cup game. <laughs> I don't know what the hell you two were doing during your career, but not, not a lot of this. He is one of the greatest. As a coach, he's moved into Union. He's claimed four premierships and two European Cups with Wasps, four Six Nations medals with Wales, three of them Grand Slams. His fourth Grand Slam came with France this year. If Planet Earth needed a defence coach, I think this would be our go-to. <laughs> Bonjour, Sean. Ça va bien. <laughs> have I got that right? I spent most of yesterday trying to toss up your winner's medals and I got to 51 in all. Have I got that close, near no, enough? 54. 54. 54. It, it depends if you count the um, yeah, the Challenge Cup. There's probably, probably maybe maybe you do, maybe you don't. Depends right. On your I, I love the fact that you can pick and choose. Won, we won that twice. Won it once with Wasp and once with Cardiff Blues. You did indeed. Do you ever get bored of winning medals or are you still always... It always still flicks your switches. I just kind of, I just remember all the bad hangovers I've had the next day. To be honest, that's <laughs> that's more more the thing. Uh, with with uh, I always remember with Wigan, it'd be you know, because the rugby league was in the winter then, and it'd be pouring down, really, really, you know, cold middle of January, and everyone would just be thinking, just dig in, boys, in the training sessions when it was going hard, in the in the matches, dig in, boys. Just think about that day after the Challenge Cup final. We're, we're all we're all on the lash all day. That was our, that was our motivation, to, to be honest. <laughs> Hell of a motivating factor that. I genuinely, I'd, I'd be interested if you could answer this. Is there anyone in rugby, either codes, you can think of who's got more than fifty-four winners' medals, or, or would you be comfortable saying that you you are the most successful person in the oval ball um, game? Either. I've, I've got I've got no idea to be honest, but um, there's obviously some guys from Southern Hemisphere, probably with the All Blacks. Who, Won a lot of titles. Um, I know Wayne Smith is somebody who probably has won more titles than me in rugby union, um, but I can't think of anybody else uh, who's won more titles than uh, except for Wayne Smith. Obviously, he's a legend and somebody who I have great respect and uh, uh, admiration for. Amazing. I can't think of. I mean, I can't think of anybody. And I'm a yeah, Even with Wayne Smith, he, he doesn't have the 32 playing ones. Yeah, I think, does he? 37 playing 37, ones. That's not turned out. How are you, Sean? It's. I mean, we are unbelievably grateful to you for coming on our show. Every week we put out who would you like to see on, and your name is just littered in the comments sections. It's it's brilliant of you to join us. How are you? How's life? It's good to see the um the French shirt on. What's keeping you busy? Um, well, this morning, as I said, it's my birthday today, but. We've been on a like a three and a half hour uh, conference call because uh, it was final selection for the autumn series, which is um, obviously the first game is very very vital for us because we have an opportunity to become the the longest winning uh, consecutive streak in uh, in French rugby history. So it's a huge game against a very strong Australian team who uh, have obviously had probably a bit more preparation than, than what we have. Very quickly, happy birthday from all of us. Did you get anything nice? Yes, my daughter's uh, kind of woke me up this morning with uh, some, some presents. It was very, very nice, yeah. They got me a card, actually, has you like this. Yeah. And they open it up, and there's, like, rave music on, and we all start <laughs> dancing. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I was just saying, I said we said off, uh, off air before we were recording, what a terrible birthday for Sean. You know, he's had three hours with the French coaches. He's now got an hour with us, but hopefully tonight he'll be out on the, yeah, right. out on the tear bar because... You know, you talk about those winners' medals. My favourite quote of Sean Ebers' quote ever is when I, well, after I won the first trophy, I wasn't involved. And I remember seeing Sean holding a bottle of Krug and a cigar in one hand. He went, Hasmet, to the victor, the spoils go. 
<laughs> and I just was like, this is this is what I want to be. I want to play for this man. Yeah. I want to drink champagne with him. I want to smoke a cigar. And every every time I'd see him, after every sort of premiership or wherever it would be, he'd just go, mate, to the victor, the spoils go. So hopefully tonight, Sean, with your birthday, to the victor, the spoils go. You've got to celebrate your victories, mate. You've got to celebrate your victories. You do. And we were pretty good at that last month. We weren't bad at that. We weren't bad. We weren't bad. You were better, but we weren't bad. I wish I was. I think I would have really grown into that team very well. You would have, you would have done, actually, tins of all people, Sean, I think would have done really well if you'd come to us. <laughs> um, I was going to say, when you took that French French job, did you realise what how good or the potential of what they were going to be with those young players. And have you been shocked by how good they are? I mean, selection now for, for this Autumn Nation series must... Can you believe how hard it is with the quality that you've got in, in depth now? Well, we've got quite a few injuries as well. Like I reckon we've got five or six players who um, are not going to be available. Cyril Bale. Um, uh, we've got uh, two or three of our, of our normal starting backs. Gabby Villiers uh, and... Uh, and obviously, Melvin Jamine got injured at weekend. So, you know, even even us with yes, we do have fourteen teams to pick from, and that's fantastic. Uh, but even even France, you know, the best players are your best players, and that's one reason that we won the last Six Nations is that we hardly had any injuries, we had no suspensions because we didn't have any red cards or yellow cards, and we won the Six Nations be because. Primarily because of that, Sean. I, I wonder of all the teams that you've become coach of, was was turning up for the French session more different than anything else? Because I imagine sort of a transition to becoming Welsh defensive coach, you know, familiar territory. Was it the most different, or was it pretty standard? Well, well, well obviously, giving your first presentation in your second language is not easy. It was difficult to do that, but I was determined to do it because I thought that they would think. That I do it in English, but you know, I I I did a lot of a uh, lot of study. Um, I'm not a natural student, um, but I did it, and um, hopefully they respected that. The answer is you have to weigh up the situation, and it comes with experience as you're going along. And when I went to Wales at first, I felt that maybe. There's been a lot of familiarity between players and coaches. Listen, I might be completely wrong because I wasn't there, and, and, and some people would might not would disagree with me. Who would? But for the first twelve months, when I, six months, eight months, when I was uh, with the Wales, I was a right surgeon major. Didn't really get close to the players because I thought that was the right thing to do. I just read the situation, and we won a grand slam, so it must have been the right thing to do. With the French team, I probably thought the opposite. I thought that maybe there's not been a lot of connection, not a lot of banter between coaches and players. I might be completely wrong, because as I said again, I wasn't there. But So, as you well know, Ask, I, I, I do like having a sing-song and a back at Buzz and uh, having a few beers with the boys. So, thankfully, um, I took that option and uh, me and William Servat was on the back of the bus singing away with the, with the players and... and um, we got off to a decent start by, you know, was beating England. I think it was 19-0 uh, or 18-0 at half-time. That was probably the right decision as well. Uh, Sean, you said you're not you're, you're not a, a strong student, but I would say of all the coaches I've ever... Oh, no, natural worked, students. No, Sorry, natural students. No, natural actually. students. But of all the coaches I've ever worked with, I've always seen, A, how you're on a path of self-development, so you're always trying to get better, but all, and but also how much care you take in, in, in learning your players and kind of study and reviewing. With those two, um, for example, Wales and France, did you did you speak to some players, get an idea? Because I heard exactly the same thing about the, the I wasn't there, obviously, but with Wales, that probably was a bit of a familiarity. But with France, the coaches kind of didn't really treat the players with respect. They didn't, they'd, you'd sort of find the, they'd find the team out in the keep, nobody would know what was going on. The sort of the the, the line outs would be given to the French team from this is talking to some of the, the players would be given to them on a Thursday before a game. And things seem to have dramatically changed. Did you do your research to, to find that out? Um, well, I did research, obviously, the research uh, you need to see is how good your players can be. And they'd obviously had two world um, under 20 champions, um, which is, is vital because you're only as good as your players um, uh, as a coach. And I also knew that because Fabian, and I'd, I'd watched the, uh, the prep games that, uh, going into the World Cup, 
I knew Fabian had sort of incorporated a similar system to what, because he was defence coach at the World Cup in 2019. And uh, I, I met him after the match and I said, you know, best team lost there, mate, um, when they had someone sent off. And he said, I said, um, but your defence was brilliant. He went, well, it was your defence, really, what, what I was doing. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was... Um, it was complimentary in that in, in, in that way. You de you definitely need the quality of players, and for me, you know, we, we, I was lucky to have some very very strong individuals with Wales and, and also with uh, with France. Can I ask you, Sean, what are you loving most about life in France? Are you out and about in the surf? Are you wine tours? Are you walking holidays? How much are you enjoying life? More I'm saying down in Perpignan. It's like any anything in life. If you have change, at first it's normally difficult. And, you know, there's obviously difficulties. Uh, I'll tell you the first week that we arrived, um, I'd already been here. I came back from the World Cup on a Monday in, in November uh, in 2019. On the Saturday, after being away for two or three months, I had to go to France, which I wasn't being paid for it because my contract only started on December 1st, but I wanted to show to Fabian, to Raf, you know, he, he was a great friend of mine. I wanted to show that I meant business. And was it difficult to leave my family after being away for three months? Of course it was. Um, but I wanted to show them that I meant business. Sean, Sean I wonder if um, in this kind of early period that you've been with France, what would you say the French have taught you and what have you given to the French <laughs> apart from karaoke skills and <laughs> the ability to smoke a cigar and drink a bottle of champagne what would you say vice versa has, has, has happened well I think a bit of banter and a uh, thing between the coaches but it's not just me William Servat is absolutely fantastic with the players and Fab <coughs> Fabian and, and Raf obviously after we've had a good victory they'll have a drink with the players as well and uh, give them time off so it's not just me it's just uh, the whole coaching staff has, uh, I have a bit of a, a percentage thing where I think in a rugby team, in professional rugby, 80% of the time you should be serious and 20% of the time you should be having a good laugh and a bit of crack between the, between the lads. I, I wondered if you're now wearing a beret, a beret and they're now a beret. <laughs> a beret, yeah. where, you're now wearing a beret and a Steve, you know, they're wearing a, you know, you're wearing a beret and they're wearing Steve Collins bomber jackets. Have you left it? Has that made any changes? Well, I've, I've given, I've still, still given the champagne out to ask. And uh, it went to, it went up a bit of a level before the Six Nations. Uh, it went to a bit of Dom Perignon oh, because I thought, I really want to win this Six Nations. I really want to win it. I love it. And then it? Antoine, Antoine hasn't won it yet. I, 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 I hasn't won it and he was, he was going mental because he reckoned he should have got it against Scotland and I didn't give one out get, after the Scotland match. So I actually owe, owe him a bottle because I thought his kicking game in the last game against England was, was fantastic and it, it kept us generally away from our trial line. So I'm going to give him, uh, when, we're, when we reconvene together, I'm going to give him a, a bottle of champagne for the last match against England. Was it also true that you, you also joined because you realised that they in France with the fashion and everything, they always wore trainer with suits, so you knew you'd never have to worry about slipping over it's on the dance floor? funny about that, you should say that, because I actually invented that style, believe it or not. Back in 2012, my mate from, 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 from West London, Treacle, my mate's called, his nickname's Treacle. He reckons I was the first person he'd ever seen have white trainers on with a suit. And I said, you're right, mate. I should, I should, be, I should be cashing it in now, and yeah. I'm not. You're not doing too bad. Yeah, then. not for the reasons why, though, probably not. Yeah. Um, just to go back to Dupont, um, I mean, the world is lauding him at the moment, watching him day in, day out. How good is he? Yeah, he's a very explosive athlete. He's probably the best athlete I've uh, coached in that position. Um regarding his strength and his power and his speed. Um, he's obviously a very, very good uh, creative player as well. But the thing what has helped us most, I think in the last Six Nations particularly, was his kicking game. And his, re his length he gets on his long kicks is very, very, very advantageous for us as a, as a, as a defence because we, we, we get something to chase after. Because if you pass the ball back to the 10 or the 15, you know, your chase has to slow down because you have to wait for the wingers to put you up on side etc but if you're kicking off nine it's obviously uh, a more advantageous position to kick to because you can just go really hard after it and try to win as much ground as possible sean uh, obviously you know half back is, is something you you know you, is a real uh, area that you kind of pride yourself on and i've seen that the d development you've done with all the players that you've coached and i remember one 
one moment at Wasp back in the day, Owen Redding, who obviously turned into a, to a fantastic player. I remember his sort of first day with, with, with you and I was doing it, you were doing a sort of a, a drill with the, the new players. And I think um, you were trying to encourage Owen Redding to give you a bit of a hit on the bag. And Owen ended up hit you quite hard, quite, quite, quite hard. You went down, came up, sort of scrapping a little bit. Have you had that with Dupont in terms of uh, you know sort of day one testing out his physicality? Because he's, a, you know, I wonder if you, have you had the better of him yet? No, he's shitting himself in my mouth. Shitting himself. <laughs> Was that because you were in your pants shadow boxing when he first walked in? <laughs> It well, feels like it's looking quite good for France at the moment, doesn't yeah. it, with the man on screen? I, oh, I, was, I was actually going to say that. You know, I, I look at you look at teams, and you know you can have good players all the time, but they can still things can go wrong. You can have good coaches who can make a uh, player. I really feel, and it'd be interesting to know whether you feel this that you've just walked into that perfect storm where your players, your coaches, the setup. You know, I think there's been bridges built between the the uh, fans. The, well, the fans, the the clubs, and the union. Do you just feel that it's all coming together a year out, and it's really exciting times for that whole the whole period in France as a country? Well, I always as people, you know, whichever club I go to or country I go to, people ask me, you know, what's your aim? And my aim is always one thing: I want the the fans to be proud of their team. That means winning trophies. Well, fantastic. With France, I wanted the fans to be proud of them. It was difficult at first for the first two years because. We pretty much invented ways of losing games. One game, we couldn't kick the ball off the pitch right at the end. And a number of times, every time we've lost, it's been virtually one or two points. So what we needed to do was get in the habit of winning those tight games. And it was a similar thing with Wales uh, in the development of the Wales team. But I'd say it was even more prominent in the French team. Um, continue to learn how to win those tight games. And uh, a lot of that is also down to goal-kicking percentages have to have a world-class goal kicker and um, obviously Melbourne Jamine the last two years has been pretty phenomenal. He certainly has. As, as you well know, you know, having Johnny Wilkinson in, in your team, um, Tim's, you know, yeah. having somebody who just regularly bangs them over, 85, 90% success rate, it's a huge, huge part of the game. Yeah, I mean, ever, ever since in my very small stint of being in, involved in coaching, it was always, you had to have that 85, you know, it's why Greg Laidlaw came to to Gloucester, it's why originally we got um, uh, the, the Patterson in originally back yeah. at Gloucester was because you can't win, you can't win titles without him. Yeah, Sean, it's fascinating. We, we'll definitely come back to this um, if that's right. C can we can I ask you a few questions about yourself because I I, I want to get a bit of an understanding of you and the player and how proud you are, I suppose, of what you achieved in the game in your boots. But before that, what were you like as a kid? It's interesting you say you weren't a natural student. What were you like as a kid? Um, I was obsessed with playing for Wigan, really. Probably the, one of the best things that happened to me was when I started to train. When I was about 12, um, I started to go down to uh, Wigan Harriers. I was training with two guys called Mick Clare and, and Jeff Lyon, and they, they, they were athletic coaches. Um, the, the Suns played rugby, and I was friends with the Suns and, and still are to this day. Um, and, and that was probably one of the best moves I ever made because, obviously, you know, if anyone, there's not many sports where be able to run for longer or run faster, or is, where it's a hindrance to you, is it? You know. So I've been learning to have that dedication to train like I did at Wigan Harriers was probably one of the uh, one of the best moves I made. And your dad was a, a league player as well. I'm just interested. Was he someone who yeah, said he was a world record signing in? Um, he signed for Warrington for uh, back in 1954 for a thousand pound, which was, that day was a world record. Wow. And was he someone who let you find your own path? And when you said, this is what I want to do, encouraged you? Was he someone who said, you'll be, you'll be brilliant at it? What, what was the relationship like between the two of you in terms um, of getting you into the game? Well, I, I read a book recently about, I think it was about the tennis girls in, in Russia and places like that. And they said there was one common denominator of, of the ones who became champions. And that was, they had very, very, very pushy parents. <laughs> and um, I'd say, not in a bad way, but my dad put pressure on me because he knew what I wanted. Um, he'd been a professional sportsman himself, even though he got a career ending injury when he was 24, which affected the rest of his life really. You know, he had a bit of depression and stuff like that because of that. Um, but he knew what I wanted. And he, um, let's, let's say he pushed me, he made me put, he knew how to press my button. But after a match, if my dad came up to me and shoot my hand, I felt like I was 300 feet tall because he didn't give prayers out very much 
But when it did, you knew you'd done well. That's amazing. I'm just interested, though, because there, there are a lot of people who potentially might want it, but they haven't got the talent to back it up. And I'd be interested, the point in your career or the person who, who said to you, Sean, you've got what it takes, concentrate, and you'll get to where you want to get to. Was there a, a game or a coach or a, a moment when you realised you had the talent to go with the desire? Well, I've been pretty successful at schoolboy rugby, which is, was really big in Wigan at the time. I was captain of Wigan under 11s, 13s. Um, and then I, I became the first person, I think, ever um, to be the captain of England schools at R Rugby Union um, and Rugby League. And I did it on the same weekend. I played, I played in Wigan um, on a Friday night against France at, at Rugby League. We won. And then we went down with the, uh, the pal of mine, Richard Gunn. He was, an, he was a Rugby League player. He played in the, in the same game. Um, he obviously wasn't captain, but uh, a fantastic player. And we both went down then to the Rugby Union uh, to Bristol, we were, we were centre purring. I was outside centre, he was inside centre, and we beat uh, Wales in a very, very tight game um, at Bristol um, to, to have a, a very, very successful weekend. But that was the game that, was the game that I really realised that how, how important the forwards are. I mean, they're very important in the league as well to, to get you on the advantage line, to get you going forward, etc. But the scrum and the line out, um, we were being dominated for most of the match against Wales. And I think that young man have even played for Wales at some time at tight head prop, I'm not sure. But that's when I realised how um, how tight and there's not much space in, in, in a game of rugby union when you're being suffocated by the opposition with the set piece. But that would have been playing league and union, presumably would have been a point when the two were pretty much warring factions, weren't they? I mean, you... I've never had one bit of problem from anybody, because I was a rugby league lad, and they made me captain. But that just showed there was no no preferences. Got on with all the lads from the private schools. They were brilliant lads. You know, I admired them, and I'll tell you why. Because, you know, some of them lads didn't see the mum and dads for two or three months at a time. And, and these, you know, people who say that these kids are, uh, are not tough, I, I think they were a lot tougher than me, because. I used to see my mum and dad every night. Yeah, I have a lot of people, I have a lot of respect for, 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 for those lads I played with in that team. Amazing. Your, your parents didn't miss you too much on this. <laughs> you away for years on it, did they? Sent, sent you at eight, saw you at 18. <laughs> I, remember, I, I remember I saw my dad once on a, on a Saturday. I said, Dad, yeah, I haven't seen you for three weeks. You, you, have you brought any sweets in for me? He went, no, your mother and I are off to the pub. I went, Dad, that's unfair. He went, that's why we've sent to boarding school, son. We don't want to see you. And drove off. Obviously did it in, in, in jest. But because you know, Sean's met my dad many times. But yeah, he, he is right, actually. You, you know, I'm not sure they were... Sean, I think you might be um, doing yourself a disservice, Matt. I'm sure you're way tougher than them posh boys. Because the thing is, they all look tough. And just because no, 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 you didn't no, see their no, mum, I'm not sure they could take a punch, mate. You know what I'm saying? Do, do you ever wonder, Sean, what might have been if you'd stuck with Union? Was there any interest in that? I mean, there must have been approaches, I'm sure. Yeah, well, up until 1995, I'd have been skint, wouldn't I? That's what I would have been. That's very <laughs> true. Because it was amateur. Therein is a motivation. I bought, I, bought, I bought my mum and dad a house outside of Wigan in 1991. And a very, very like plush area of Wigan. And people said, what's the best thing you've ever done? And it was that for me. Because um, to buy my mum and dad a house. And, and my, my younger brother at the time, he unfortunately passed away a few years ago. But to buy them a nice house in a plush, see my mum going into a plush area. She never had any money in her life. Um, that was uh, very, very good for me. Just going back to the fact that you played rugby league and rugby union on one day, then fast forward it to 1996. And you've obviously, you you played against... Well, you played in the Middlesex uh, Sevens back in the time. Then you played the old Bath versus Wigan codes. game, the Clash of the Codes. Yeah. I didn't play. I didn't play in. I'll tell you a story. I didn't play in the. Uh, I didn't play in the in the rugby union game because a lot, a lot of people were saying, "Oh, you think you might have a bad because because we beat Bath quite convincingly at rugby league." Um, people were saying you, you might have a chance of winning against Bath at rugby union at, Tw at Twickenham, and I'm thinking we have got absolutely. <laughs> Not a chance in hell of getting anywhere close to him, never mind winning. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody this, obviously, because I was trying to promote the match, etc. Anyway, our chairman came up to me. I brought my rib, actually. I brought my rib. So I said, he said, how's things? I said, yeah, I'm all right. I said, but I've got this badly broken rib. And uh, I said, um, it's this match against, uh, against Bath, because I knew with no chance. And uh, anyway, I'd heard that the lads were on four grand. Just for win, that's for win, lose or draw. And um, I said, but I said, the, the, I 
got this bad, bad injury in it. And we've got a big game against St. Helens in a couple of weeks and I, I don't know what to do. And he said, well, don't play against Spath. I said, yeah, but, you know, the money's good. And he went, he said to me, I'll do, I'll do, what, I'll do my best. So I come back and he said, what about two grand for not playing? I went, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> 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 oh, what a protege, yeah. Hask! Right, what a I protege you are. Yeah. A few years back, we did like a battle of we did a similar game, Battle of the Codes, and and I, it just absolutely blew my mind how different it is. You spend your whole life in rugby union trying to bounce to your feet, compete, or get back in the line, whereas you've got to completely flip your brain around to just not do anything, lie on. So. Uh, and I just couldn't, it, you kept tackling people, bouncing up, which meant they could get up quicker, play the ball. So no one can get back 10. And it's just, it was just madness how, and then you, but then also you flip it around, no idea at rooks and malls. Um, and then people say, well, what's the best game? I said, well, you get your kicks out of each each side. And the, I actually really liked playing rugby league when I did it. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you, some of them black lads who came up, we, we beat them easy. I can't remember who's 70 or 80 or something. But some of those black lads, would have been very, very good rugby league players with just about six months coaching. A bit like when Scott Quinnell came up. Scott Quinnell came up. It took him a bit of time, but Scott Quinnell was developing into a, a really international class rugby union forward, uh, rugby league forward, sorry. Um, then he obviously he returned back to uh, rugby union when it went professional. But yeah, you just need about six months, I, I reckon. If you're in the playground, Sean, which of these two, Hask and Tins, would you pick for your league team? Well, I'd definitely have Tins at centre. I'd, I'd have Hask probably, probably front row in rugby league, mate. You'd be actually a good position. Uh, and middles, they call them middles. So one of you, at the moment, you have you have your front row and you have a, another second row who, who defend in the middle, work work the middles, and then you have your edge players as well, right edge, left edge. Oh, yeah. You'd be a middles player, I reckon, Hask. I've got a bit of the old key senior league. The thing lid. about the rugby league players at the moment is the big difference to when I played and something what Ash would be very, very good at is um, the fantastic wrestlers. Because you're allowed to be on the floor wrestling the guy you're in for two, three, maybe even four seconds. And then if you're in a dominant position because of the wrestle, obviously it's a very slow ruck and it's a similar thing to Jacqueline. You know, slowing the ball up, um, and that's why that's why uh, the, every single one of these guys nowadays are fantastic wrestlers, and, and they do wrestling practice virtually twice a week. In rugby. Yeah, I could get, I can vouch for that because that's what blew me away about playing rugby. when they when so we played like Keith Senior, Martin Gleeson played, um, yeah. <laughs> and I just couldn't, long. You, you couldn't get over how how hot you just couldn't move. They just knew how to just drop an arm underneath your underneath your yeah. shoulder and you just can't you can't move you're trying to get up but and you're just exhausted if you try to fight it so you just yeah. well especially because I wasn't professional anymore really no really wrestlers nowadays biggest probably I'd say that's the biggest difference from when I played fantastic wrestlers can I ask you about you as a player um just success at every turn what what were your hallmarks as a player what defined you when you look back now in your career um well do you know when you play football and some is a goal anger. Yep. Anger round, round goal and don't really do much besides that. That was me. But I'm in rugby, in rugby league terms. I, I scored I scored 300 and odd tries and beat about four people. You were quick as well, though, weren't you? What did you yeah, do? Yeah, what, 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 no, what, what I was, I was, um, I, I, I was a person who studied the game. I studied the game. I love tactics. I still do. Um, I think uh, Sam Tonkins uh, once described me recently as a nerd, a nerd of rugby. And um, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, and being a nerd has, um, has, has worked well for me throughout my life. I've ended up playing, obviously, a decent rugby league player and being, um, hopefully, not a bad coach either. And what defined that Wigan team, which, when you look at it on paper, is possibly one of the most successful in any sport of all time? Well, obviously, very strong characters, like any, any winning team. Um, the fact, as well, that there was no salary cap in them days and that Wigan bought the best players from around the world. And, you know, you look at somebody like Man City, et cetera, with no salary cap in the Premier, in the Premier League, it, it certainly helps, doesn't it? You know what I mean? Buying the best players around the world. I mean, that Harland they just bought, he's a fantastic player. Um, even though I know they lost against Liverpool at weekend, but, I mean, a marvellous team, aren't they? Same as Real Madrid and teams like that. Um, but you can do that sometimes and sometimes... 
the players just fight against each other a little bit. And you have to harmonise all that, all them, all that ego, uh, which but I think ego is a good thing in rugby. You need ego, but you need positive ego, thinking I'm better than him, we're better than them. And, but you have to guard that ego altogether because if you don't, it can split the team. Were you mates off and the that, field? That's an art. That's an art you get as a coach. I think it definitely helps if, if you've been a player um, a little bit, as long as you don't keep thinking back to your day and, and realising things change as years go by and tactics change and, and even people change a little bit. You know, guys are into social media and etc. Et uh, nowadays, which would probably be a worse nightmare when I played. Um, but you have to accept that and you have to go along with it and you have to work with them. And one thing that Wayne Bennett always taught me is that you have to remember how young your players are. Yeah. Because you're not speaking to people who are my age now, my age now, you're speaking to lads who are 21, 22, 23. You have to think what you thought that when you was 21, 22, 23. Because you have to speak their language. I, I'm interested because there was... So I grew up watching Union, but I could name that Wigan team that you were a part of. It was just a galaxy of stars. You often hear about successful teams that don't necessarily get on off the pitch. I think of that Australian cricket team of, of the late uh, sort of mid nineties, early two thousands. Were you friends off the field in the main as much as on it, or were you quite a different collection of characters? In the main, in the main, yeah. But there's nothing wrong with it. Like you say, there's nothing wrong with a bit of friction as well. Um, friction. You know, creates energy, doesn't it? And uh, the energy, as I said before, as long as it's guarded in the right direction and come game time, all that energy is uh, pushing him in the same direction, uh, you have a very, very powerful force. Throughout the week, it doesn't have to be perfect all, all the way through the week. You can have arguments, you can have little punch ups. I mean, I remember being at Wasp and uh, sometimes uh, I used to think I, I should have bought a ticket for uh, some of the punch-ups they had in, in training every now and again. But I always, I always wonder if Lawrence might have, a, have it with, with Sam and Shaw, but it never happened, did it, really? You no. know what I mean? The, the, the only time I ever saw... Um, it, was on, it would be on pay-per-view, wouldn't it? It would be on pay-per-view, that, wouldn't it? It would have been Who'd the have only won? time. Yeah. I, saw, no, I think Shawsy would have won. Just not not because Lawrence can't that. fire, because Shawsy's just so strong. But he had horrific dad strength, Shawsy. That could he could tear a man in half like a beer mat. I remember I remember the only fight I ever saw that I thought was going to be blockbuster was Joe Wor Joe Worsley versus Lawrence Stalio. But um, because they obviously competition, you know, Lawrence two different characters, two you know very very talented players, two people with massive heads. But um, I knew it wasn't going to go well when Joe Worsley went to punch Lawrence, but just hit him with a wrist on top of his head. And I was like, right, this is not quite the fight we uh, we thought we were. You know, and obviously Lowell came out with all the bravado about bringing the tools and someone's going to get knifed and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, Lowell went to his car. No, to I, didn't get say, I didn't say knife. I didn't say knife. No, I didn't say knife. To bring, no, don't, let, don't let the truth get away a good story, Sean. He went to his car to get, <laughs> went to car to get his shooter and then he remembered he wasn't a gangster and didn't have one. So, um, yeah, it was all good. Actually, I never had a... I never had a scrap with. I had a few fights with people. Never Lawrence actually. Who did you fight with? I fought with Alan McKenzie. Fought with Trevor. Fought with you. Fought Raff, with Trevor. Fought with. Uh, I fought with quite a few people. It's not a wise thing to fight with Trevor. <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't a wise thing to fight with Trevor. But I mean, I mean, I, I punched Trevor t twice. Nothing happened. He punched me once. Just split the top of my eye on my cheek. <laughs> right. Within within two seconds because he had leathery old skin. <laughs> so yeah, not not ideal. But no, there was never. I mean, I'm trying to think. Sean, can you remember any real big bust ups? I, Lucy Cipriani? No, not 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 massive, well, not massive ones. Not right on for ages. No. Usually punch themselves out after five seconds. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um. Tell us about. I mean, do you know? Sadly, Sean. Well, as we're recording this, the, the news is literally coming through that wasps have gone into administration, which is I don't think it's hugely surprising. It's it's literally just broken in the last few minutes. But Lawrence was very very emotional about the fact that that the club that meant so much to him has gone. I just wonder what your reaction is. I don't think it's sort of surprising necessarily, but as as man who was such an integral part of Wasp's biggest era of success, what, what do you make of that news? Well, obviously incredibly disappointing. Um, without Wasp, it would have been difficult for me to have a, uh, the relationship I have now with my son because um, I didn't have the money to live in uh, West London, but because I got a job at Wasp, and that was one of the reasons that I went to Wasp, um, there was two reasons really. One, I wanted to prove myself in rugby union, because I didn't think I'd done it by just playing schoolboy rugby. Um, and the other one was because I wanted to be close to my son. And I'd always followed Wasp, and I'll tell you a reason, that's you'll laugh at this. It was, was it, it was the sevens 
uh, Twickenham Sevens 1996. And uh, guess who's captain of Wasp is Lol. I'm captain of Wigan and uh, Lol comes out and smash these. Let's smash these rugby league so and so, smash them, give them some <laughs> everything. I thought, God, I really like this guy. So I started following Wasp and making, they were my team. They've become my team because I really liked Lawrence's attitude. Then obviously I ended up ended up being there and being ended up head coach, etc. But it's a huge part of my life. And um, yeah, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like tearful to think that um, what's happened. But all I'm thinking is Wasp is usually bounced back. You know, it's been through a lot of different difficulties throughout its existence and uh, hopefully it can bounce back with, um, as well again. Fingers crossed. Let's hope that there is a, a, a way forward for the club. I mean, it was interesting, we spoke to Warren um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, and he was just saying about for all that he's achieved in the game and, and you'd be up there in, in the same regard in Union, the Wasps days were just some of the most enjoyable because of the magtag bag of people that it was and the environment that you had and almost that success was a a result of the soul of the club rather than spending money, etc. Do you look back now and just think those were some of the great days? Yeah, because it was it was absolutely pivotal for me because um, I lost my brother in a car crash in two thousand and three, um, and it was it was I've been at Wasp about twelve months by that time, and the support I got from them lads, um, you know, the support from the staff and, and from the lads is something I'll never forget. And that, that's what really kept me going because if I'd, if I'd had no job at that time, if I'd no job at that time, I'm not sure which way my life would have gone, you know what I mean? Um, and so those lads, the support I got, and being busy every day and being, and being, and being part of the Wasps, it was, like, it was like it was us against the world sort of ass, wasn't it? Everyone was saying, you know, uh, they don't have a proper training centre, we, like, we love it, um, you know. They, they, they have these strange tactics. They keep keep the ball in play. They don't never kick the ball out. You know they have this rush defence, which was you know obviously new at the time. So we were prepared to take a risk, um, and uh, we, we were definitely a group of individuals who came together and uh, with a certain energy. Can I just quickly ask you because you mentioned about your your son? Am I right in saying that he's he's been elected? Is it councillor in Westminster? Yes. He, um, He's, he's the councillor in, in, in Bayswater now. He's, um, he's only 25. I came over from France to, to help him out the last couple of days. Um, so at the end of what had been a 12-month toil for him, uh, knocking on people's doors, you know, hoping that, asking them to vote for him, etc. cetera. Um, it, but, and, and, he, and he was, at the time, he was also assistant to a Welsh MP in, in, uh, in, uh, in the House of Commons. But he's gone back to... Um, Going back to study at Oxford for, for years, he's doing a master's in um, in politics, with uh, obviously with an aim to return um, in some in some way to uh, some sort of politician uh, job or uh, environment in London. Would he London like to or, Would he like to become a you know me- member of Parliament? What's What's the sort of the the, the ultimate well, goal? I presume so. Yeah, I, pres- I presume he wants to do that. Um, we, we we always used to speak about. Um, Different things, you know. Even when he was young, um, speak about history, um, you know, speak about politics, etc. And um, it, it was it, we always encouraged him to to have an opinion, um, but have an opinion with having actually studied the subject beforehand. Does it get your sort of character? Because we could probably could use that with it. I was going to say. Our, in, in politics right now, about a bit of shadow minutes. boxing, a bit of intimidation, a <laughs> bit of speaking the truth. We could well, probably it, do it, that it around. Well, he came out here recently. He came out here and uh, we, we were doing mitts every day. And uh, yeah, he got himself in, in some pretty good fitness. Um, could he, was he in the Wasps Academy as well? Yes, he was in Wasps Academy. And um, unfortunately, which ended up being fortunately really, um, he wasn't selected to go up to um, uh, up to Coventry. Um, it was a big blow to him at the time. Um, but then he decided to go to return to study, and uh, I was very, very thankful because I'd always wanted him to become a politician. Was that a conscious effort on your part with what, how your dad treated you in terms of putting a lot of pressure on to be 
But he, I suppose, he knew that you wanted to be a rugby player. But I, just on mine, my dad put a lot of pressure on me. My dad got injured when he was supposed to have been a very good rugby player at the time, and he got a career-ending injury at 26. And he still, to this day, tells me he was better than me, which <laughs> I say, well, get out your CV too. Um, but yeah, you know, were you? I, I've sort of felt that with my kids now, in the fact that I'll let them get there and then I'll push them rather than trying to tell them that I want to do something. Was that sort of how you approached it? Because of how your dad had done it, you were like, well, I'll let him figure it out himself. Yeah, I think I kind of realised James is a different character to me as well. And you, you have to realise uh, the person that you're dealing with. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do agree. You have, to, uh, you have to read the situation as it's going along. Um, I did one day, I did remember um, when, he, when he was saying that he wanted to be he wanted to try to be a rugby player. And um, so he went out on the last with the boys on that, which was okay. I didn't mind that one bit. But uh, I sent him a text that um, I'll meet him at the track. Uh, uh, I think he'd, he'd been out till about four or five o'clock in the morning. Um, but we'll, we'll be training on the track at 12 o'clock and I absolutely flogged him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was, he was running around and you could see he really, really didn't want to be there. But my, my point, what I want to make is, what I wanted to make to him is, whatever you do, have to be fully committed to it. Don't half commit to one thing, half to commit to something else. Give it 100%. But just interesting, go back to the political thing. Were you quite political in your youth as well? Because am I right to say you taped over, was it the British Coal logo when you were playing for Great Britain? Yeah, yeah, I did, I did do that. I did do that. But it was, it was more in support of the miners. Uh, well, it was in support of the miners at the time. I was obviously a northern lad. And um, it was affecting a lot of people around the areas that I, um, you know, where I come from, really. It's, it's been a little bit part of my legacy, really, because everyone kind of brings it up as, as, I'm, as I'm speaking to people, as you have done today. Um, but all my granddads were, both my granddads were miners. Uh, one of my granddads, the, the pit came down on him twice and he was trapped under water, underground for like um, a day and a half, a couple of days once which is obviously pretty horrific. And then imagine having to go back down there again, what, two or three weeks later, after um, you know, a bit of uh, recovery. So it was a tough laugh. Um, and so I was really supporting my, my granddads. And my dad was a, a pit man as well until he, he got injured playing rugby when he was 24. It's unbelievable. They just don't make them like this no. anymore, do they? They really don't. Um, just, just to move on, Sean, to, to Wales and some unbelievable days. Um, actually, just before I do that, I've got to ask you, your memories of a young Hask, a little bit more hair, perhaps slightly refined chat. What, what was James like when he first turned up at Wasps? Oh, mate, he was, you, you could see he was uh, one for the future without a shadow of a doubt. Um, he, had the, um, he had the size, um, he had the athleticism, but he also had the attitude. Um, you could tell he was very ambitious. Um, and them's the kind of guys you want to be around. Like I said to you before, people talk about ego in a negative way. I think ego can be a very, very positive thing as long as it's going in the right direction. First impressions? And, and, and I definitely had that. I mean, look, you know, I've said on, on record a million times, if it, if it wasn't for, for, for Sean, I wouldn't have had, you know, on those was days, I wouldn't have had the career I had. I think, um, you know, it, just in terms of the one-on-one -on -one coaching, the... Uh, ability to get the best out of you, to also to define yourself as a, you know to, to define me as a player. I think you know a lot of guys try to be um, do everything, but actually you know Sean was like you know especially with the aggression around our defence and the attitude and the kind of determination and the the emotional energy required to play top level top level rugby. Sean in, you know instilled that into me, and I think um, of all the coaches I've ever had. You know, when when Sean would take a session, the emotional energy of the whole place would go up. You know, I'd never experienced um, that level of kind of determination, clarity of kind of message, and also even from a personal point of view, I remember there was one um, one particular season. I think in pre-season, every time we were doing fitness, Sean would come in and join in with us, which is always you know, which is always quite intimidating because you know Sean's a machine. I mean, he, he was wearing full clothes, not just his pants, which is a, a benefit. But you know, he'd come and do the runways with us, and he, you know, he'd run next to me. He'd be like, "Come on, Hash, you're an eighty-minute man. You're an eighty-minute man. You're an eighty-minute man on me all the time." Um, and then we then played Leicester away actually, uh, and we hadn't beaten Leicester at Welford Road for years, and we beat them that day. 
and he was on me for that 15 day. Fifteen years we haven't been on for us. Yeah, fifteen years. Fifteen years. years. Fifteen years, and I, and he came up. He just came up to you after the game. He said, "You're an eighty minute man today. You're an eighty minute man." And I just that was kind of the the birth of me becoming a, a, a boy trying to play rugby to a man, um, and I kicked on. And all those lessons that I learned from those early days at Wasps, the way I wanted to defend, the profess the professionalism, the expectation on the on the players around me the way to communicate to players, the understanding when to talk quietly and when to bring the emotional energy was what I learned from I learned from Sean. And everybody that ever worked with him says the same thing. Where do you get your leadership skills, qualities and presence from? Well, I played halfback um, and most halfbacks, um, you know, it's pretty much a job to be a leader. I had three careers really as, um, as a rugby league player. Um, one as a utility player, whereas... Um, because in them days, um, there was only one back substitute. And uh, I used to tell the coaches that I, I, they say, who's played on the wing? I say, I've played on the wing loads of times. I used to do it at school. They had never played on wing, but I knew the role of every position because I, I was, a, and I, I'm repeating myself, I was a nerd of the game. I studied, studied every position, you know, what they wanted in certain moves, etc. cetera. Um, so that's, that's, that's where it come from, really. Just, I think as well. Just I was just was smiling when when you know Sean talks about kind of knowledge of the game, but also, you know, I remember those sessions in the gym where Sean would make me hold a Swiss ball next to my head while he pra practices boxing, and I'd say one out of every ten punches, I'd get a clip, <laughs> I'd get a clip round the ear, but like, mate, hold the bag still. I was like, and obviously because I was. No, it's just Sean Edwards who talk about the greatest rugby league player of all time. He's like, ha 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 ha. You're like, and one would just hit you in the face, and all of it was kind of that character building. And I joke with, I've joked about Owen Redding. I'll never forget. You know, like Sean would join in, but he would he would demand the physicality from a player, and if the player wasn't given the physicality or someone was trying to get one up on Sean, Sean would then react. And like, you know, I've never forget that thing with Owen. He tackled him to the floor, and as he comes up, Sean's digging him out, <laughs> digging him out, sends him back. But everything had an edge. Everything had an edge. And that's what that's what professional sport's about. It's kind of uh, leaving no stone unturned in the pursuit of of excellence. But you can't play international rugby, club, club rugby, and want to be successful without an edge. And Sean brought an edge to everything. And actually, it was interesting because you, you quickly found out who were the players who were prepared to be uncomfortable, who were the players that could actually deal with that, um, that intensity. And there's no mistaking the French team, their unity, because through, through physicality and a bit of turmoil, you have a unity of the side. You can talk about it, but unless you go through it, unless you are um, prepared to, to put each other through it, like he said, that bit of friction, how are you ever going to uh, put it on on the weekend? And suddenly through that, you start making bonds. And then the people who aren't prepared to do it are isolated. And that was the thing, you know, you were either on, you were either on the train going forward, or you, if you weren't prepared to tackle, weren't prepared to play, weren't prepared to be intense, weren't prepared to dig deep, you were found out. And I think that's the mark of every side that Sean's ever coached about. And it's, it's, it's no miracle that every time Wales came to play England and say the Six Nations hadn't gone particularly well for Wales, there would be an incredible emotional reaction. And you know who would be pulling the, pulling the strings in the middle of it. And I think that's what's unique about him. Please tell me the times you hit Hask holding the medicine ball. That was deliberate, and not not just a mistake. I could take a punt, can Hask? He's, uh, <laughs> he's got a strong jaw. <laughs> he certainly the does. Size of his noggin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell me about Wales, Sean. You're obviously fully entrenched now with France, but tell me what what Wales and Welsh rugby and the Welsh rugby public mean to you here and now. I think the Welsh rugby public um, really took me as one of their own. They seem to like my style of coaching, and um, I still get really good vibes every time I go to Wales, go to, go to Cardiff. And, and they could probably see me as one of being one of the wrong, really. And for looking enough for me, it became my job. The, the question I was going to ask you is, as a proud Englishman, what were your emotions like on the days when you had really big wins over England, significant victories over England? I'm thinking the 30 points to three, the World Cup game in 2015, etc. Was that just 100% joy or was there ever a sort of, ouch? Well, the one in 2015... Um, if we answer one, I'd have had no job about three, four weeks later. So you could say I was a little bit relieved to say that. And I wish it wasn't England we'd knocked out, but it, it was. So, you know, unfortunately, I, I still had a job. Um, and I know some lads lost a job after that. Um, so I did feel for them in that way. Um, and what was the other question you said? 
J just about the, the sort of the emotion, I suppose, the 30 points to three as well, which Hask would, would have delighted. Yeah, yeah that, one, that, one, that one was probably the best international uh, game. Basically, I, I'd, I'd been dropped from, from the Lions. Warren Gatlin hadn't hit, selected me. The first game of that competition, we were absolutely booed off the pitch against Ireland in the first game. It shows how quickly rugby can turn, particularly international rugby. And then what, six weeks later, you have a, probably one of the best games in Welsh rugby history. And that's how quickly it can change in international rugby. And we, we beat England uh, 30 points to three. And we actually, we actually created a record, which is still the record now, and I think it will be for 100 years, is that we didn't concede a try the equivalent of five games, which the way the game is at the moment, there's never been as many tries uh, in the game as there is at the moment. There's so many, so many tries. A lot of them from malls and a lot of them from pick and go, but there's still a lot of tries at the moment. And from half time, I think it was against Ireland, to what ended up being the next campaign, uh, half time against Italy, it ended up being the equivalent of five games without conceding a try. And uh, I thought that was a good way to react to not being picked of the Lions. How awkward a conversation was that with, with Warren when he said he wasn't going to take you? I don't know. You better ask him. <laughs> but how, did you, how did you... Very uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable for me because I was getting dropped. <laughs> yeah, but, but was it was it a surprise? Because you, cause you and Warren have uh, always been yeah. very good if, mates. If I'm, honest, if I'm honest, Ass, at the time, England had just beaten New Zealand. I think they'd won uh, quite a few of the autumn games. We'd lo First time ever, and the only time ever, we lost every single autumn game. And we, we were in good form. Um, I won't say we were defending great or either, but um, it, I think it's just a. And, and, and Faz, Faz was the defence coach for England at the time, and um, you know I don't think he couldn't take Rob Early and me as well, so he selected Rob Early. Um, and, and let's be honest, it's, maybe it was the right decision because they, they won the series. So it's all about the, the end result in the end, isn't it? But did it hurt at the time? I was the only person dropped uh, from the. Uh, from the previous 2009 series, which I thought was a, a fantastic series. It was an amazing series. And, and that is still the worst loss in my career, um, the 2009 second test. It still, still haunts me to this day. Did, did Warren, um, when he said that you were, wasn't going to take you, was he? But did he leave a lot of distance between you two? Did he do it behind a bulletproof well, he was wall? On, he was on the phone. Oh, he was on the <laughs> phone, <laughs> shut, really? I don't remember, but he wasn't coaching Wales at that time because... Um, he was having a sabbatical. So, so I, to, to say I was pumped up for the Six Nations w would be an understatement of the century. Yeah. The first game went absolutely diabolically wrong against Ireland, as I said. And then we won in Paris. We won in Paris. And the whole, as I was telling you, how quickly it can change the momentum. You know, as we, yeah. we've been in many battles over the years. And the, how quickly you can just see the whole momentum change. Then we, I think we went to Scotland and won. We won in Italy. And then it all came down to the last game. And obviously what happened, happened. What was it like on the pitch that day? Honestly, it's the most intense atmosphere I've ever had in my whole career. And I played in front of Wembley 100,000, with 100,000 plus at Wembley in the um, 85 final and early... Um, I know Wembley went down to about 85, 90 afterwards, but I played where there was 100 plus thousand there. Uh, but it was the most intense atmosphere, probably because of the roof as well. Um, it was the most atmospheric game I've ever, ever been involved with. In. And I read an interview with Sam Warburton and, and he, he said exactly the same. And I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I'm, I'm staying on the pitch for the national anthems ask because I'm doing the hits after the anthems, because we want to switch on to rugby after all this emotion. But anyway, I goes back up to, goes up to the, to the coaching, uh, coaching uh, area. And in the game, I'm screaming and shouting, I'm doing things, what exactly terrible coaching. I'm going to go up the referee from the stand and everything. <laughs> Robert, Robert and he goes, Sean, calm down. Just calm down. I went, and I knew I was, what I was doing was totally wrong and it was like terrible coaching. I went, yeah, Rob, you've not just been on that pitch down there during the, the national anthem, mate. That's unbelievable. I was, I honestly, I was on fire. <laughs> I love that. Just, you literally yes, thought you... Never, I, 
the atmosphere was just incredible, honestly. Did you carry on? Did you carry on doing that, or did you sort of learn your lesson that it's not good mixing you with anthems <laughs> and doing the hits? Did you have to step, yeah. step back from that? Yeah, I, I, I sort of took, took a, a sideward step on that one because just too much emotion with the anthem going and everything. It's amazing. I'd love to know the, what what you're like pre-game and actually what you like pre-game as a player. But I can remember watching. I think it might have been. Heineken Cup in 2007. I remember you sitting in the stands reading a book pre-game. Or have I made that up? Trying to myself down, that's why. Is it? But that's that's quite an unusual sort of just take a good novel and, and sit down and, and read as the stadium fills up and your well, team get ready to go to work. There's nothing worse as a player than to have too many messages. Would you agree, Gas? Yeah. yeah. It, it can totally confuse you, draws all your energy because you're not just concentrating on one or two or three things. So, us as coaches, we have a we have an habit of sending out too many messages. So that was a way of me keeping my mouth shut and prioritizing my messages. So in between, when when there's a stop in play, I just have a little read of my book and remind myself keep your mouth shut unless it's vital. Do you remember, um, Sean? Do you remember where, obviously when you worked with Geech at Wasps? And now I see what your logic was. Do you remember Geech used to do sort of those pre those pre match talks about kind of the uh, pearl necklace and the chain of pearls and his shoulders? And I could see you sitting there, and obviously he would speak quite quite verbosely and talk for sort of you know ten minutes, and you'd be like. Yeah, right, lads. Anyway, thanks, Keech. Listen, just get off the fucking line, hit them. Don't worry, don't overthink. Just do your fucking job and, and then walk out. Did you struggle? Do you struggle sometimes to work with coaches who just talk too much? Some of the tactics that Geech brought in at Wasp, particularly the pick and go, is doing full circle and coming back into the game a little bit now. Well, a lot a lot now near the trial line, obviously, because there's so many tries go from pick and go, isn't there? You know? Um, whereas not many people at that time were doing as much pick and go as, as probably what we was doing at Wasp. You know, we'd set a target and then Tom Reese would have a pick and go. You know, if you remember our Lincoln Cup final, we did that tactic against, against Tigers. And um, in some aspects of the game, particularly the contact area, was, was way ahead of, of what the other teams were doing. And um, it's something that, you know, you don't have to be Einstein to see that France are pretty good at, uh, at um, powering around the corner and... Um, and being physical in those tight exchanges. And so um, a, little, a lot of Geech, particularly, um, you know, off the field as well. Um, and, and one thing about Geech is that he's such a nice person that he came to Wasp as Ian McGeechan and he could have come in and wanted to change everything, couldn't he? But he had the intelligence and the lack of, uh, the lack of ego to just sit back for three or four months, see how they work. Because we've been very successful, haven't we? We've been very successful before Geek's come. And I honestly think because of that, our success continues. You know, we won under Geek's, we won um, a championship, Heineken Cup, and the Anglo Welch when it was a huge major trophy. Sean, I'm conscious of time. I'd, I'd love Still to keep. keep... Geek as well. Yeah. I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious you've got a birthday cake to go and cut in a moment with 21 candles to blow out. Just a couple of quick ones before we finish. Do you think France have got everything they need to win the Rugby World Cup next year? How confident a camp are you? You know what? People keep asking me that question about the World Cup and it's very difficult to look so far forward. And, and do you know why? It's because in the game of rugby at the moment, one missed time tackle and, you, and you're down to 14 players. So how can anybody predict the future? with the situation. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing. I'm not criticising World Rugby one bit, but, you know, that's, as I said before, one of the reasons we won the Six Nations is we didn't get any red cards. We actually went five games without getting a yellow card, which is some effort, isn't it? Some effort. And uh, if we can continue in that vein with our discipline, we have a chance to give a good account of ourselves at the World Cup. Yeah, you, uh, that's what I was going to say. Are you, are you very happy where you are, squad-wise, personnel-wise, um, momentum-wise, uh, and, you know, I suppose, feeling yeah. within camp? Because I, I don't think I've ever seen, and, you know, this is going back to when, the good old days when Benazi and Kelly and all those great French players of the past that I used to, do battle with back in the early 2000s i haven't seen a french team as what i would say together yeah with one sole goal and you know the days of france not uh, they'll say oh it's raining they won't turn up or 
they've got to travel. They won't turn up. I don't see that with this group. And so, in terms of looking Thank you. for... Thank that, that, that means a lot coming from uh, an esteemed player like you, mate. Really, really does. Thank you very, very much. It's, well, it's a pleasure. Would it, from that point of view, are you really happy where you are? Obviously, those decisions that in modern day rugby can happen and you never know, you can never predict that. But you're going into every game thinking we've got a better than average chance. I repeat myself again. You always want the best players available, right? And even us, even us, we have injuries. It affects us a bit. But we do have a certain amount of strength in depth. I think the attitude of the, of the players, and this is, this is a big thing. It's a big thing. They are desperate to play for France. They want to come to the environment. I think they enjoy the environment. But I also think they prepare to work hard and they want to improve. And that's a huge thing for, for, for top-class players to come. And it was a little bit like that at Wasp. When players came to Wasp, they came, usually for a bit less money. They came because they wanted to improve. And, and a lot of time, they wanted to get in the England team because they knew the financial rewards would come with that. Hopefully, we're building a similar thing here uh, in France. I'm conscious of throwing too many questions about the future at you, but we've got 150, 200,000 listeners a week, 99% of which are England fans. Would you like to coach England one day? Would I like to coach England? I, I, I love coaching. And um, I've said many times, what I'm, what I'm interested in is long-term employment. And I, I want to continue in international rugby. I've got a meeting with the, with the French uh, when we're in training camp about extending and uh, I'll listen to what they've got to say. Have you got the so, phrase beaucoup de l'argent down? Uh, pardon? You say you need to just make sure you say beaucoup de l'argent, lots of cash. Oh, beaucoup de l'argent. Yeah. Oh, That's the only bit you need to learn, mate. Just get in there. I said, I said, to, I said to Dan Bigger, can I borrow your calculator? <laughs> yeah, it's fucking hell. That calculator's got a lot, a lot of space for zeros on it. I tell you, they've got one or two things going on at the RFU at the moment. But if no, seriously, though, yeah. What I'm interested in is, is long-term long-term employment. I, lo I love being involved in international rugby. Uh, for me, I love the Six Nations. And uh, yes, the World Cups are obviously every four years and uh, you know, they're fantastic and it's in France. But for me, the Six Nations, it has a fantastic spirit of its own. And it's, it's the competition that I always judge myself on. Interesting. You can read into quite a bit of that, but yeah. hopefully there are sensible people listening who are going to get their calculators out quite quickly and pull up a four-year contract. I hope so. And listen, I, you know, I'll speak to my friends at the RFU. I haven't got many, but I'll speak <laughs> well, to a couple of people. Looking around this, this room, not many of <laughs> yeah. us have got that many friends at the RFU. See if I can't get Sean. But Sean, if you need a social secretary or a team manager, if you ever make the change and France don't turn up with the cash, you know where to look. There's a, there's a couple of guys here that'll be able to help you out. Unbelievable. Sean, you are, you are you are one of the true greats. We, we would love to go to so many other. Oh, here's a ridiculous, stupid question to finish with. 54 medals in a cabinet. The fire alarm goes off and you can grab only one of them. Well, good question. My favourite victory um, as, as a coach, because I was head coach as, as well at the time, was um, winning the Heineken Cup as a coach because it's a, it's a very, very small amount of people who's, who's coached an English team um, to win the Heineken Cup, and uh, um, I, I know actually the Chiefs won it recently, uh, but actually I was the last person before uh, before back to the Chiefs with, with Wasp, with uh, with Rob Baxter, obviously um, to to win the Heineken Cup with Geach. Geach was our was our director of rugby, and I was the head coach, and uh, it was a bit of a mastermind plan on that day, and uh, a lot of things went right that day. Asked them, they did. The only thing what went wrong was. What happened when you, you, you got clear and nearly went the full length of the yeah, pitch, didn't you? I know, don't. Do you know what? That still keeps me awake at night. I think if I, I fell five metres short of the line, if I'd stopped looking behind me and just run and even died or slid, I would have scored the single-handed greatest try I'd ever done in my life. Think of your showreel. It would have been a... you're, you're exactly like me. You you just think about the things what you could... I know. You, know, like you think about the disappointments, not, 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 the, not the great I times, don't you? I know. I'm so annoyed. I'm so annoyed about that. But live and learn. At least it made it in some sort of highlight reel, but it cuts off just yeah, before but, I fell. Yeah, yeah. What a man. Can you just yeah. sum up? I mean, just... Yeah, listen, icon. you know, I think... Um, you know, I've talked about it many times. This podcast, you know, I love, I love Sean. I, I, um, you know, from a personal point of view, but also from a coaching point of view, you know, I, I if as I said, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have had the career I've had. I think every team he's, he's gone for, um, they adopt, you know, the the essence of Sean Edwards seeps into the, the team. That determination, and I think a lot of people talk and ask you to do things. 
that they're not prepared to do. But everything that Sean expects of you and asks of you, he does himself. And he did that as a player, the dedication, the focus. And I also think when you have someone who has had his level of success, you um, you can sometimes sit back and be like comfortable with where you are. But whatever I've always seen, and sometimes Sean wouldn't have even known that I'd be looking, but seeing how he's always keen to work, to develop, to get better, to, you know, even just the, the nuances of dealing with the individual players, to the messages, to the kind of thought out plan um, and to the emotion that he brings. And I think um, it's amazing. I think England, hopefully, will listen. He's got, he's got a long journey to go with with France, but England will be richer for it if he ever gets to to do that. And he's one of the greatest coaches that um, that has played the game and I've ever worked with. So, you know, I wish him the best of luck and ho hopefully he gets all the, all the cash and, and then wins the World Cup and then, the RFU go mad and and rename the stadium the Sean Edwards Twickenham Stadium and get them over here. Oh man, it's long term employment. <laughs> <laughs> That's sometimes more important than cash. Yes, long term. I got employment. it. We've got it. If anyone's listening, Sean wants long term employment. So a ten year deal on good cash. We've got him. We're going to clip that up, put it on a DVD, and send it to B Sweeney Esquire <laughs> at rugbyheadquarters.com. Um, Sean, thank you. Do you know, the thing I love the most is you said it's okay to be a rugby nerd. And as someone who has suffered from that affliction for about 35 years... Yeah, I'm, but I'm, he can't name every sponsor <laughs> that's ever been in rugby. He, he, he talks about actual practicalities we, about rugby. We've not worked just together go, oh, that was Hang on, we've worked together, together a couple of times at Sky and Sean brings the deepest file of facts of relevant information of any man I've ever worked with. So that's good so enough just for like me. Hask, it's just like Hask. Hask is in leaflet form. Hask is empty. Sean, happy, happy birthday. Um... Candles, big celebration tonight, or just a little bit of, you know, family uh, time. Quite, quiet one, quiet one tonight. Good man. on there. I can see the twinkle yeah. burning already. Yeah. You're an absolute legend. Happy Enjoy the um the autumns when they come along. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'll look forward to catching up again soon. Good on you. Cheers, Sean. Abiento. Thank you, Abiento. And there he goes. It, it, what is fascinating, not only speaking to one of the greats of of both codes, but how clever he and Warren are at just. I mean that is a that's not a come and get me, but it's if you want me, this is what it's going to take. My, my best, the, yeah, but my favourite bit is the sat back, Sean, is yeah. the thinker, the composer, the lean forward, yeah. Sean. Yeah. Ask, ask. <laughs> I got a story to tell you. Ask. Remember that time? There's a little bit yeah. of sexy beast in there, Ben Kingsley, isn't there? That honestly, I mean, I wouldn't dare say no. it to him because you know, yeah, that's what it is. He's yeah. exactly like that. No, no, fuck no. Um, it's the same thing with uh with Warren. I'd call up Sean Edwards to tell him that he's not. You know, he's not picked because you won't be in the same room. No. Because, you know, he's just, uh, the thing is, you're right. He has, he has such dual personalities. And also, I saw it um, when he's coaching because he's you know, it's quite religious, Sean. Mm. Um, he's obviously had some tragedy in his life. He's kind of this melting pot of different emotions and he has so many different gears and he's always thinking, but you're so, you're so right. It, that's the best thing. He's got such a warm personality. He wants to gather you in, then he keeps your arm length. Then you're in there. But if you get too friendly or uppercut your chin, you take the floor. Then he'll pick you up, take you for a pint, then fill you in again. It's um, it's uh, yeah, been, I love it's him. I've been married, isn't it? Really, in some ways. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But it is amazing. It, you just, I get a sense of that from you know having played with Andy Farrell as well, and you know, you see the, the league is. I think. You, difference, one of those differences between Union League is Union is Sappuccinos yeah. and probably the other side dark humour whereas a lot of league it's about it's pick up the lads yeah. it's constant chat constantly in your ears we've got this as you said when you're running thingies you're an 80 minute man you're telling you that you're and constant feedback on the positive level whereas I don't know why rugby union is a lot of it just built on negativity, negativity. <laughs> but, welcome to our show well, but I, I say one as well because obviously Sean is still coaching France but that's part of coaching is taking the right job at the right time yeah. and I think both Gatland and Edwards have been absolute masters yeah. at that fascinating I hope you enjoyed that at home keep an eye on there but what, what I think falls out of that is the RFU have got five days to get their act together yeah, yeah. but five to five to 14 days to five to 14 days a long-term contract yeah. I'd love to know employment I'd love to know how much those England players would love to work with Sean Edwards when you see what he's done and you hear the stories of wasps, you see what he's done with Wales. I mean, he squeezed those pe pips in Wales yeah. to get the absolute maximum and you see what he's done in France. Well, it's Halloween around the corner of the RFU, better get their pot out and start mixing up some potions yeah. and see what they can up with. and potions. Speculate to accumulate. Brilliant. Uh, let us know your thoughts. Just a quick note at this point from our new partners at NordVPN, a very warm welcome to the GBR family. It's great to have you alongside. And they are offering the good, the bad, and the rugby listeners an exclusive deal to protect your internet connection and privacy online. <coughs> 
One or two of us have had problems with our <laughs> online privacy in the past, haven't we, Hask? Have we? Not with NordVPN. Not with well, no. Now I've got NordVPN, actually. I'm absolutely secure. Uh, we've had a fair amount of offline trouble as well, one or two of us. So let's just say that we're speaking from experience, yeah? Sign yourselves up as quickly as you can. You can grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash goodbadrugby. NordVPN.com forward slash goodbadrugby. You'll get a huge discount on your plan and an additional four months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Eddie Jones, this is a very strong squad. It's vibrant with a number of good players who have been left out. We're pleased with the depth and strength of the squad for the Autumn Nations Cup series. Autumn Nations series. No Henry Slade, arguably the biggest talking point. Are we surprised by that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, but... Ugh. It su suggests that uh, he's going straight back to Manu, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, I, I think it is, I just think a left foot as well gives you so many more options in that midfield. But um, yeah, we'll see We'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, you know, there's still time for it all to change in terms of, you know, you never know who might pop in and pop out. It's sort of a squad. I love it when the England and their squad, they can change pretty quickly. Can't yeah, they? shuffle the pack a little bit. I think, yeah. And some of it m might be a test. You know, obviously the Vodapolas was a test to see whether they could progress and get better, um, whether he'd have them back in. And he gave them every opportunity and they've done that. And so they're back in. I think Slade, he could be, you know, I don't think he's dropped it. I don't think he's, I might be saying talking rubbish, but I don't think he's dropped him out of the squad. I think this could be just a little sharpener for him, just to remind him that he is, uh, he's not invincible and that he, he needs a bit of time. Miss Autumn, you know, play really well, motivated and come back for the Six Nations. I don't think anything's permanent with yeah, I think I think, but th this is the the tough thing around now with England is I want to see a little bit of consistency in the squad. So I'd like, but I was about to say, but you know, with Ollie Lawrence, how well he played on the weekend, yeah. And I always thought he he did a pretty good job for England. Um, now he's um, you know, unfortunately with Worcester, he's he's gone to Bath, which who can't win a game, but he played exceptionally well on the weekend. Uh, there's the space there. But Jack, he, what does Jack Willis do as well? Because he's yeah, he's well, yeah. That, I was just about to ask well, the question. He's been called in. Yeah, but he goes. Well, yeah, but what, what happens? What happens? Now, if, if they, if well, I presume he'll end up on loan somewhere. Apparently, there are offers, inquiries in for Launchbury and Willis from other Premiership clubs. Right. Twenty of the Worcester players have picked up work elsewhere, oh, which is great. Has Kvesi got picked up work off last week? I sincerely hope so, but I haven't heard anything yet. Okay. Um, Rib Dave Ribbons. Yes. Very you good player, it, didn't you? really good player. Yeah, yeah, but, but sort of very, very physical, uh, very talented. He actually flirted a couple of times with um, putting ribbons in, and he was yeah, in yeah, a couple of England squads. Yeah. Well, we talked a couple yeah. of times about it. Last he was year. in, and then I, and then I think one of them unfortunately had to pull out because he was injured, and then ultimately, and then he, he I think he was in a couple of times and just never got selected. Alex Cole's another one. Mm. Um, he sort of. It's one of, those, one of those weird things for me because he was one of the younger players when I was when I was there, and kind of. Um, has really kicked on. You know, some players you look at and go, you probably just need to knuckle down a bit more and, you know, sort of get that bit of edge. Yeah. And he's done exactly that. I think credit to, to Phil Dowson and, and and the rest of the guys there who brought him through because he's looking very, very good. And, yeah. you know, if you'd asked me, what is, was he going to be an England player? I would have said, I'm not sure. But now he looks a million dollars. So it turns out, what the hell do I know? It's nothing. See Rupava Ruff, Ruskin. Yeah. In there. Like Val. yeah it, Caden Merlian um, from Quinns as well. Um, McGuigan and Tizard of Saracens, the other new cap. So we'll see what Eddie Jones does. Argentina, 6th of November, Japan, the 12th of November, New Zealand, the 19th, and South Africa on the 20th. It's going to be interesting to see if there's a change between, you know, first two games and then maybe a change before the big two. Um, that'll be interesting. Have England got to win four out of four this autumn? Three out of four? So, uh, look, I think... That South Africa game is outside the window, so they won't have their French or English-based players. The likes of Pollard. Well, he's been not been playing very well, has he? He, he limped well, off after just, 26 yeah, he got minutes. Injured, actually, but I'm Facts. Just, Colby, the yeah, details like that. Hello. Yeah, I, I just. I what of England? What, what is a successful autumn England for England at the moment? Uh, you, well, you know, Test match rugby is about winning, so four wins will be outstanding for them. But I need to see like performance. Uh, you know, if you look back at last autumn, yeah, they got they got the winning in South Africa, but the creativity that then went into the Six Nations wasn't really there. So I need to see, you know, that a style where you think they're going to score points. Hmm. Uh, and I, th I don't think the Six Nations really saw that. Um, so they've got to find that again. They've got great individual players. They just need to be singing off the same hinge sheet a bit better than what they were in the Six Nations. We Wasps, can you give us a sensible line on your old club? They're gone. <sighs> 
I, very interestingly, having spoken to a couple of people, um, your man there at Richardson's been nowhere to be seen. It's always disappointing that, and if you steered the ship into an iceberg, at least you got the dignity to stand at the front and go down Have with it. Have you got it. a personal thing with him? Yeah, I don't got a personal thing with it. Well, yeah, I mean, well, it depends. I've got a personal. I haven't spoken to him since I left. Um, I think that he was a saviour of the club in regards to no one could have saved it. He saved the club. I think pretty much after that, did he and the rest of the guys drop the ball and, and you know, steer, steer what could have been, I think, a good vehicle into an iceberg? Yeah, 100%, I think they do. And I, and I think that um, the relationship with the players and the way the players were talked to was not was not, was not not done properly. Um, and I think it's very frustrating. So I think he went from hero to zero, and I think it's devastating the club's, the club's gone. I... The problem is I just don't see how you come any get any way back, you know, because it's one thing to pick up all the debts of a club. It's another thing to pick up a £36 million pound loan on top well, of that. Out of administration, you might yeah, just buy the brands. That, well, that's the thing. Off. I think, you know, <laughs> businessmen are smart enough not to take on that debt if they yeah. can get rid of it in administration and then... Yeah, and then pick it up. I mean, it might, be a, it might be a master plan. It might be a master plan. I just feel for the players, the staff... You know the lead, the, all the people that have gone gone in. You know, it's the same conversation we had with Worcester. It's it's awful, but I think it's kind of without being callous. So much is happening in the world, in rugby, in sport. You know, even our, our own political landscape, cost of living, everything's up in the air. You know, Ukraine, it's just everything's falling apart all over the place, and it's very hard to know what to really put your emotion into without just being very callous and very matter of fact. And I'm like, my thoughts are with the players. The, the staff, the club. And I just think, you know, it's just the way that life's going. I and mean, I hope they can resurrect it. Maybe someone really smart is going to pick up and sort it out. Wasps will never die because of all the players and all the legacy and all the stories. Mm. You, know, you never take that away. You don't have to have a building or a stadium or a team to not reminisce. You can't eradicate names from um, trophies and stories. And, 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 you know, and every time we ever get together and you walk into a room, there's that smile that you always have in that moment and that reminder. Like with Sean, you know, I haven't spoken to Sean for ages. I mean, the last time he, he messaged me, congratulated me on, on the birth of, of, of Bodhi. Um, but before that, you know, you don't need to speak to someone every day not to be have that warmth, warm relationship. And that's the best thing about Wasp, I think, with any other club. You're going to have that heritage, and particularly with Wasp, because of the mad characters and the mad stories. Some of it you know about, some of it you'll never know about. Well, unless you do another book. But but even I, I, mean, yeah. I mean, you get, but as Hask has always described, they've always walked that line, and that's built the players in the players that they could be. And unfortunately, the line, when you dice with the line too much, you know, given what we've gone through in the last five years, yeah, yeah. It makes it harder to dice with the line and stay on the right side of it. I like Lawrence's line, which is that Wasps is not a place. Northampton, Bath, Gloucester all play. Wasps is not. It's a, it's a, it's it, a concept. No, and, and I think, and I think the bizarrely, the characters of the of the club who've played are just some of them are so off the wall and so and so mad, and they're, and they're so unique. And it was such a unique thing because it never really did have a have a home. And I think. You know, you might die in die in name, but you'll never die in spirit and character. I like that. And this week, in the name of Grassroots Rugby, we've got a very special fixture, which is a Tins 15 against a Hask 15. Have you actually managed to find 15 or not? It's not it doesn't always need to be a 15, Alex, because, you know, obviously it's hard. Uh, it's, I was with... Um, I was up at... Harrogate Pythons on the on the Thursday night, and then I was over in Hull at the Hull Ionians, and I met a few other rugby clubs there. Sorry if I've forgotten everyone who wanted to get a mention. Uh, and sometimes you know you can't feel the full fifty. I, 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 the guy who was speaking to me was saying he was ta they were taking uh, sixteen in total to a match. So I think there's a bit of what we're going to also demonstrate is how you can manipulate the Good. the the laws so you can still play, you still get a game done even if you can't get your full quota out. Good. You're not playing. No, Your feet don't work anymore. No, so your hands never tins. did. So you're going to do a warm up uh, and tins. You're going to be playing alongside the likes of Lee Mears, Tom Wood, Dylan Armitage, and Matt Banahan and Phil Vickery. And Phil, wait, hang on, I haven't got to that yet. We'll also be joined on the day by front row rugby royalty, a member of the 2022 GBNR Tour Global Tour, and a 2011 MasterChef winner, Phil Vickery. I played with him uh, for the with the with him uh, for the Cherry Pickers. Um, for a Dave Sims um, uh, fundraiser, and I he's lost so much weight he was flying around the field. Really? Yeah, he actually looked good. You should stop and ask him a question, and that will that will yeah, slow yeah, down. Yeah, yeah no, that was the thing. <laughs> Just talk to him any ruck, and he'll yeah. go into talk to him about, he'll, love. Talk to him about like, love. What do you think about love, Phil? <laughs> Just you know, everybody love everybody. Let's just get on. And uh, and then before well, we know, a lovely it, the message to be spreading at this 
it's very juncture true, yeah. of our lives. Uh, the fixture is part of the RFU's Play Together, Stay Together campaign, which will take place on Thursday, the 20th of October. It's going to be live streamed. We're going back to live broadcasting, baby. Yeah. Uh, on the RFU's Facebook and YouTube channels, kick off at 7.45 p.m. What are you hey. doing on the day at, the sh- at this? Um, Nothing, really. Just having a good time. Yeah. I mean, they're not, they haven't paid me the full budget, so they're sort of getting only half the ask. I'm just going to do a bit of warming up, a uh-huh. bit of chatting. Not a sc- have a velvet rope around me, encouraging people to get in the game. Well, you're the perfect one because it's about bringing this sort of age group back to the clubs, back to the enthusiasm, getting, you know, just pitching in. Even if you're not going to play, it's about being around the club, making the club the focal point of the community that you're in. Chats, pints, good times. I'm going to bring my boots and run touch. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, we're definitely getting you on. That is it. Thank you very much indeed to the great Sean Edwards. Good luck to him come November. Well done to Elmer and to Rocky as well. Lovely to see both of them. Lovely to see both of you, I think. We have been the good, the bad, and the rugby. We will see you next week, if not before. The show is produced by the fabulous Shara Kilgallen and the wonderful Ollie Hunter. The good, the bad, and the rugby is a folding pocket production. Have a very good rest of your week. Bye-bye.